Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is our second Sunday with the Lord's Prayer, and today we get to the very heart of it all. This mysterious thing that we call the kingdom of God. For Jesus, the kingdom of God is the focus of everything. That phrase, kingdom of God, or in Matthew's gospel, he calls it the kingdom of heaven, shows up 149 times in the New Testament. And nearly all of those are in the four Gospels. There is nothing else that Jesus talks about so much as the kingdom, not God, not forgiveness, not even love. There's just one little problem with Jesus' teachings about the kingdom of God. He never tells us what it is. In fact, most of what Jesus has to say about the kingdom of God, he says in parables. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed that grows into a great shrub. The kingdom of God is like a measure of yeast that leavens a whole loaf of bread. The kingdom of God is like a great banquet where the poor and the outcasts all come, but the rich are too busy to attend. The kingdom of God is like wheat sown among the weeds or a pearl so valuable you sell everything just to buy it. The kingdom of God is like a vineyard owner who pays all his laborers the same wage, even the ones who only worked an hour. Christian teachers and biblical scholars through the centuries have had just as hard a time as Jesus putting this kingdom into words. The kingdom of God, some have said, is what the world looks like when God's will is done. The kingdom of God is God's reign invading the brokenness of human history. Isaiah describes it as the wolf lying down with the lamb. John Potmos, the guy who wrote Revelation, that weird book at the end, says it's like a great new city that descends from heaven to earth. Everyone knows what the kingdom of God is like. No one can quite say what it is. Now, I put in the sermon right here because I am not foolish enough to think that if Jesus can't define the kingdom, I can. But I am foolish enough to keep going a little bit and tell you a bit more of what we've learned the kingdom of God is like. I'll tell you a few things that I and others have learned about this tension, tensions in which the kingdom lives. First, the kingdom of God is both religious and political. A pastor friend of mine recently interviewed with a new church and they asked her, are your sermons biblical or political? She answered, yes. <laughs> yes, her sermons are biblical. Because as Christians, we are called to proclaim the good news of the gospel, the word of the Lord. And though Jesus is the ultimate word of God, we find testimony to God in scripture and in the theology and traditions of our church. And yes, she said her sermons are political because while they do not read like the five o'clock news, thanks be to God, they put the Christian faith in conversation 
with this real world in which we live. Because when Jesus separates the sheep from the goats and commends the sheep for doing God's will, he does not say, I was hungry and you gave me a Bible. I was thirsty and you sang me a hymn about water. No. The kingdom Jesus proclaims is on earth as it is in heaven, and therefore it has to do with earthly things like food water. My seminary ethics professor, the late Dr. Katie Geneva Cannon, always warned her students that it is pastoral malpractice to preach about the pie in the sky and the great by and by to people who are living in the real world. Or as Karl Barth famously put it, preaching in Nazi Germany. We read, we walk through the world as Christians with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. In case you're wondering, my friend got the job. <laughs> it turns out that uh, people are hungry to hear a word that takes both the gospel and the real world and talks about how we live the social, economic, political, spiritual world in which we find ourselves. That's the first tension. <laughs> the second one I find even harder, actually, is that this thing we call the kingdom of God is somehow both entirely up to God and a project in which we, humans, are called to participate. That one's been hard for the church to wrap our heads around. From literally Jesus' time till now, people of faith have argued back and forth to be pray and trust that God will bring the kingdom. Or do we get involved in this world and do we try to make it into a place where the wolf lies down with the lamb, where the hungry are fed with sweet bread and fine wine, where we beat our swords into plowshares and study war no more? Again, it seems the answer is yes. Yes, we pray for a kingdom that only God can bring. And yes, we work every day to make things on earth as it is in heaven. Knowing that all of our human efforts will ultimately fall short of God's glorious kingdom. Now that's a tough calling, isn't it? To work for a kingdom that is always beyond our reach. Some days it feels discouraging or maybe even a little dishonest. How do we preach good news to the poor as Jesus taught in a world where the rich get richer and richer? How do we follow the Prince of Peace in a nation that day by day is more and more armed? And can we really, in good faith, join the Apostle Paul in proclaiming that in Christ there is no slave or free, no male or female, when racism and misogyny are running rampant on the loose and it seems no one can quite rein them in? Yet even so we pray, thy kingdom come. And then perhaps it's naive or perhaps it is faithful. We work <laughs> to make it so. Which brings me to the third and final tension in which we Christians who pray thy kingdom come live. The kingdom of God has not yet come. 
And yet somehow, in Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God is already here. The kingdom of God has not yet come on earth as it is in heaven. Anyone with eyes to see or ears to hear can surely tell you that. But we are Christians, the ones who confess that Jesus is Lord and no one else. We believe that the gospel changes everything. Our faith teaches that despite all appearances in Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God has come near, still comes near. The kingdom of God is at hand. Certainly it's not complete, but just as a seed germinates and grows in the ground, just as yeast leavens the bread, the kingdom of God is there where we cannot see it behind the scenes, working in our midst. And every now and then, we who continue to pray, thy kingdom come, get a little glimpse of the kingdom. So I want to close by taking a minute to ask, where have you seen glimpses of that kingdom. I saw those eyebrows raised. You don't have to say it aloud, but you can. Where have you gotten a taste, even just a little bit, of heaven on earth? Does anything come to mind? Clouds, sky. The clouds and the sky, especially in this season of Monsoons galore. Libby. The little girls. <laughs> the little girls running past. They are heaven on earth, are they not? Yeah. The sunsets. The sunsets. The food that was taken to the men's shelter last week. Give us this day our daily bread, right? Or I see the shirts. the shirts. Oh, you stole one of my illustrations. I have seen it in recent weeks. And yes, these shirts bought by this congregation for kids who cannot afford their own shirts. Students who will never know who bought them those shirts, but they will be clothed and they will be stylish. Thy kingdom come. I've seen it in recent weeks sitting around the table with Mac at the Episcopals and Sherry at the Methodist and Julie at the UCC, trying to start a conversation about faith communities and climate change. Thy will be done. And I witnessed the kingdom for a moment on Friday when I joined Dave Wasserman and his family out at their home in Valle Escondido. The reason that we did the baptism there and not here today in worship is because Dave wanted two things to happen together. Placing the memorial marker on the grave of our beloved Marnie Alt-Wasserman. And then for grandfather to hold his granddaughter and gently pour the baptismal waters on the forehead of their granddaughter, Merrick Alt-Wasserman. Tears of joy overlapped with tears of grief. And for just a moment, the veil was pulled back. And our hearts saw things our eyes could not see and our mouths could not name, except to say God was there. It was the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. 
Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Friends, Jesus is Lord. So therefore, despite all appearances, we pray thy kingdom come. We work for the kingdom and the world. And we trust that God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May it be so. Amen.